Thank you all for joining us for this information session. Tonight we will be discussing the online and part-time graduate programs in systems engineering offered through the Whiting School of Engineering at Johns Hopkins University. My name is Cheryl Williams and I am the Recruitment and Marketing Specialist for the Whiting School of Engineering. With me tonight is Dr. David Flanagan. Dave is the Vice Chair of our Systems Engineering Program. He teaches a number of courses, including System Conceptual Design, and mentors students through completing their capstone projects. He is a member of the Principal Professional Staff at Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, where he has worked as a systems engineer for 18 years. At APL, he works with government, industry, and academic organizations to plan and execute analytical studies in support of advanced concepts and integrated acquisition strategies. Dave is also a graduate of our program, having earned his Master of Science in Systems Engineering at Johns Hopkins in, in 2007. Uh, he earned his PhD in Systems Engineering at George Mason University in 2013. Dave, would you like to say hello? Hi, how is everyone today? All right, great. Thank you, Dave. Uh, for tonight's presentation, we'll start off with an introduction to Johns Hopkins Engineering. Next, Dave will discuss with you our online and part-time degree programs in systems engineering. Then we'll talk about some helpful information on tuition and payment options, review next steps and important dates, and we'll end with a live question and answer session. If you have any questions at any point in the presentation, please type them into the questions tab on the control panel. If you are joining us via a cell phone or a tablet, please just select the question mark to access the question section. We'll address all questions at the end of the presentation. So why study engineering at Johns Hopkins University? Johns Hopkins University was founded in 1876 as the nation's first research university. The School of Engineering opened its doors in 1913, and in 1915, it began offering part-time engineering coursework as night classes for technical workers. Since then, we've grown to offer more than 20 master's programs that can be completed part-time. 16 of these programs can be completed entirely online, our programs are designed by people who thoroughly understand your industry. We like to say that our programs are for engineers, by engineers. Our faculty are all expert and working engineers. Dave will talk more about our faculty in just a few slides. Our faculty and instructional designers also construct new and update existing coursework every year so that it includes the most up-to-date information. In addition to our part-time programs, the Whiting School of Engineering has over 25 centers, research centers and institutes. This includes our strong partnership with the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory in Laurel, Maryland. We also offer full-time bachelor's, master's and PhD programs. Our online and part-time programs are led by respected senior engineers from our Applied Physics Laboratory and faculty from our full-time programs. We are ranked in the top 25 best online graduate engineering programs by US News and World Report. And of all the schools that are included in these rankings, we actually have the largest online part-time student population. So not only will you have lots of fellow students going through a similar learning experience, but these rankings really speak to the quality of our programs regardless of our size, and our school is experienced and well-equipped to help you navigate graduate education as an online student. The degree that you earn studying with us part-time is of the same quality as our full-time degree programs. Your diploma will not say online or part-time. You are eligible and highly encouraged to participate in commencement. And as a graduate, you will be one of more than 28,000 Whiting School alumni and will join our esteemed international alumni community. So that is an overview of who we are and the value of our programs. Now Dave is gonna to talk to you a little bit more about our programs in systems engineering. Dave? Okay, thanks Cheryl. 
Okay, so uh, so this is um, kind of important. If you um, have an ABIT accredited uh, undergraduate degree here, so uh, so we are the as Cheryl mentioned, we are the largest systems engineering master's program um, in the country, and we're also the largest to receive an ABET accreditation, and really the first to be able to uh, to say at a civilian university for systems engineering. There's only two other um, organizations um, that have ABET accreditation for systems engineering, and both of them are associated with the government. So yeah, so this is something that we're proud about. Um, what ABIT really does is make sure you you have a standardized process um, that you can apply uh, and repeatable to all the different um, instructors and courses. And as you can imagine, you know that's that's a challenging uh, a challenging thing to do, but it also makes it um, standardized throughout the entire um, program. And so it doesn't matter uh, like which instructor you have, uh, you'll get the same uh, core materials. Uh, and, and so I think we'll we'll talk about ABET and what that matters in a couple of slides uh, for for the different master's uh, programs. Okay, so this is uh, this is who we are. Uh, you know, about 1,200 students, and it is a um, it is a different uh, mix here. So there's live um, students, uh, meaning live as in in person. Um, you're you're all live, um, and then you also have uh, online. Uh, uh, which is actually the majority of uh, of our of our students now, and um, and then our partnerships. Um, so our partnerships. Let me explain just a little bit. So partnerships are uh, a unique element. So um, right now we have a, a a standing partnership with Raytheon uh, Corporation, and so with that organization uh, we go. We it's just the Raytheon students in that cohort. Uh, they they go through the same program, a little bit more accelerated, and uh, and they also have some other uh, co-instructor <clears throat> uh, instructors that share uh, share some instructor duties with us. So the majority for for what you're uh, what you're here for is more of what we call a public program. So that's the online or in-person uh, program here, and, and we'll talk about a little bit of the differences between an online and a live. And virtual live uh, course. Okay, so why I talked about ABET here. So if you have an undergraduate ABET accredited uh, degree engineering, uh, ABET accredited undergraduate degree, then you'd be eligible for what we call the Master of Systems Engineering in Systems Engineering. Okay, uh, if you don't, if if you don't have a engineering degree. Um, so like I was a physics major, so this would be, you know, just the, the it's a master of science in system engineering. So, uh, you know, math, science, you know, other than engineering, then you just have an MS instead of MSc. The, right now, the difference is is nothing um, in terms of what you do for, for classes at, at Johns Hopkins. Uh, it, it all just depends on your undergraduate um, uh, degree, if that was a better credit. So that's 10 courses. The, the course, uh, the program of study is 10 courses. Um, for those, there are some, not not a whole lot, um, that may already have a degree. So they may just want extra uh, extra instruction, uh, extra formal instruction. So a graduate certificate is six classes, uh, and a postmaster's certificate is uh, four classes. So the graduate certificate is really if you, if you already have a master's and you're not interested in another one. This could be for you, uh, and, and we'll talk about it when we get to the different classes. Here's the core, the core classes, uh, and, and they're about the same. Uh, you do a little bit more work for the rest of the master's program. The post-masters is this is uh, really ideally if you already have a degree in an engineering degree, uh, and really your your four courses in this post-master certificate is our four advanced uh, courses. So system of systems engineering. Enterprise systems engineering, system architecting, and management of complex systems. So the, that's that's someone that's already has a uh, a master's, and they want like you know the extra extra details in in the advanced courses. So that's what the you know, post masters is. Okay, so admissions. Uh, so I make the admissions decisions here. Uh, this is what an ideal candidate. Uh, um, uh, is or has you know if you have a stem kind of degree 
uh, if you have it above, you know, 3.0, and if you have, you know, more than one year uh, work experience. And so we'll just kind of explain, uh, you know, sort of the reasoning why. So, so obviously, if you have a, a STEM degree, then you know, that makes doing a STEM master's, you know, a little bit more applicable. But if you don't, you know, that's that's not to say we will not take you just because of that. Um, and so we, we look at the entire sort of picture here. Um, obviously, with grades, that's important. Now, if you're if you're a bit older uh, and if you have more work experience, then that will help, um, you know, kind of weight that a little bit more uh, to kind of make up for a, uh, you know, you know, a, a lower GPA. Um, if you don't have as much experience, then obviously your GPA, you know, basically your 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 relevant you know experience is kind of a little bit more weighted to the GPA. And why we talk about work experience is that it's a practitioner type. Uh, uh, based profession. So we expect as part of the assignments, as part of the discussions, um, that, you know, you can teach, I can teach you all about uh, requirements and architecture and testing and things like that. But the real learning comes from other students and their experiences in the workplace. And let's give some, you know, good, good and bad examples of requirements, good and bad examples of testing. Uh, you know, good example of that examples of architecting and integration. So if you don't have that experience, that's very hard to contribute to the to the collective class and learning. So that's that's kind of why we, uh, <clears throat> we we say that. So that's when we say the whole the whole uh, picture. That that's kind of what I what I consider some some uh, and then some uh, some admissions are either uh, full admit or conditional admit. Conditional admit is is some that you know may may not have you know all the three checks there uh, you may need a lot letter of recommendation that might help also um, and, and it limits you to basically the first two classes and if you do well with those two then then you're fully admitted there so it's a little bit of risk reduction for for both sides for that and, and as you can see there uh, no GRE is uh, is required uh, which which kind of sets us apart from uh, other other programs okay so for the master's program, it's 10 courses. Um, you have a five-year window. Um, so that's generally like about two courses a, uh, a year. We have three semesters, spring, fall, and summer. Um, we realize, though, that uh, you know, some employers may have caps uh, for financial, um, you know, financial purposes. So, you know, and, and Cheryl's going to talk to you later about uh, uh, finances. So, we realize you know that that may play into it so you know it's a comfortable pace if you want to take all the way up to to five years you know one one each semester maybe take one semester off uh, and, and so we'll go into it's composed of core classes um, focus areas which is really uh, another term for electives and then the project or thesis uh, to round it out so this is what everyone does for for the master's uh, program So the core classes, these are these are the five classes. And so as we were talking about the, the conditional admittance, so those are the first two classes there. So introduction to systems engineering gives you a, a good description of what the life cycle is and how systems engineers work. Uh, and then also management systems projects, um, before we used to call it introduction to project management. Um, th those two uh, areas, engineering and management, are, are kind of tightly intertwined. So that's that's the, the introduction to both of those. So the last three courses, conceptual design, design integration, and, and test and evaluation, that's it, it it looks at the entire life cycle again. Uh, so systems in the intro to system engineering, it goes broad, covers the entire uh, life cycle, but a very shallow depth. And then these three other courses, uh, the three last ones, revisit it but in a lot greater depth. So conceptual design talks a little bit more about you know the, the initial um, requirements, the concepts, the trade studies. You know what does the what does the customer want? Kind of making something out of nothing. The design and integration is the follow-on, and that's as you start to build some components, and then now as you start to you know Lego block them and build them up, and then finally the test and evaluation. Um, you know as 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 stated there, just to make sure it all works before. You, you go out to the field there. Um, so that's really the five kind of core core classes that we talked about. 
And so these focus areas are, are a, another means to be able to help shape uh, some of your um, uh, electives. So you have, uh, so based on this, um, so you have the five, five core areas or five core classes. Um, for the most, for the most part, you'll have, um, you know, two electives, a, an advanced course uh, of the project, and then possibly another kind of core class. So, so everyone, um, the default is the systems engineering focus area that you see on the bottom there. Uh, and so those, that's, um, so, so I can explain that. So that's the, uh, the, the software engineering is another kind of required course, because again, software is pretty prevalent amongst all systems. Uh, you have two electives that can be from any uh, program, not just systems engineering. Uh, so if you like something in space systems, technical management, uh, biomedical, mechanical engineering, you know, things like that. That's, um, you have the, the flexibility to, to pick those types of electives. So two of those, uh, the, only, the only constraints are it has to be 400 level or above, and you have to meet the prerequisites to, to get into that course. Uh, and then one, one of the, the, uh, the projects, uh, and then the last class is your sort of post-project, your advanced class, like we just talked about with postmasters. So that's the systems engineering. If um, it's it's a default um, based on. So when I look at your resume, when I look at your academic background, I kind of look at and see do you have any of these other uh, traits there. So if you're a big software person, if you're a big cyber person, you know, hey, here's some other options that uh, you know if you get accepted. Um, you know, Cheryl gets accepted and she, we can offer her systems engineering, focus area, software, and cyber. And then she picks one of those and then kind of drives through uh, the rest of the program. Um, these do not show up on your diploma. These do not show up on your transcript. It, it's just another area to be able to kind of focus, uh, no pun intended, focus your, um, your electives uh, in a certain area. Okay, so that, as you can see, that's a pretty wide variety of uh, focus areas. So about, uh, so the, the final project, the capstone project, um, so about 95% of the students will take this. Uh, so it's a one semester uh, program. It's self-paced, so there's no instructor at all. Uh, you're assigned a mentor and then you do you do everything. So it's it's intended to be at the very end of your program, and you're supposed to be able to demonstrate all the skills that you've learned, you know, from the previous couple of slides, on, and and you build your own, you pick your own project type. Uh, so a lot of people have done uh, uh, things like uh, elevators for cars in a um, in a in a big super su uh, skyscraper, um, <clears throat> automated uh, restaurant uh, menu and delivery. Uh, a lot of smart uh, appliances, a lot of sports types, uh, you know, training type of projects, um, you know, smaller uh, kind of UAV, uh, you know, other applications uh, to that. So the intent here is to be able to build some type of a concept, uh, and then you and then you go through and you work through some of the requirements, some of the architecture, some of the trade studies, some of the testing, uh, you know, capabilities that you the skills that you learn uh, throughout the uh, the course there, and then you work with a project mentor. You do all the work. They're there to be able to uh, uh, review your products, give you some, uh, give you some guidance uh, and instruction. And then your your final product is a uh, presentation, one hour presentation with the final report, which is basically all your deliverables. And this is like about a 200 hour kind of effort, so it's it's not an insignificant amount of, uh, of time there, but, um, but it's, it's very rewarding to see students at the end, you know, as, as you know, literally the, the light bulb is like on, it's like, oh, now I understand. I've done the other nine classes, but now I understand how it all comes together as a system engineer. And it's really rewarding for us to be able to, to see that as well. So again, 95% do that, and hopefully that will take about one semester. So again, 200 hours, one semester, you're you're working you're working uh, quite a bit even though you have no classes you're you're doing uh, you're hustling there uh, the thesis is two semesters and so this is uh, ideally um, 
oriented towards if you're thinking about doing a PhD program, this gives you a little bit of taste uh, of, of what it's like. So you build a committee like you would with the doctor program. Um, we, we provide some of the, uh, the people there. And then you're really doing some, some research uh, for that. Uh, unlike the project where you're kind of building some of the materials, but you're not really doing a lot of like original research. The thesis you actually are are building, building it all, and doing it all, and, and really the product is a paper um, that would be like to a peer-reviewed sort of journal, uh, you know, professional journal. Um, so this is this is something that you do as a doctoral student, uh, and then you write your, uh, you know, you write your whole like, hypothesis, and here's your tools. And here's all the data that you're collecting, doing a literature review, you know, building it all, analyzing it all, giving your other uh, um, uh, conclusions and, and what, what to do. And so it is it is kind of a taste of what you're doing. It is a two semester effort uh, and you work in the first semester is really building that concept and your uh, proposal and doing a lot of literature review. And then your second uh, semester is actually doing all the work, building it, generating the data, and, and writing the final uh, report. The modeling and sim, uh, simulation focus area is the only focus area that requires uh, this uh, thesis, uh, ostensibly because if you're doing some modeling and simulation, you're going to have some of those tools to be able to generate some data to be able to, uh, uh, to build your work for that. Um, but that, that's that's kind of the difference. Um, and if you're wondering if you, you know, don't don't sweat it. If you think you want to do a PhD, this isn't required. Uh, I myself did the project, and then I went through fine, fine with the uh, the PhD program. But it it does give you a taste. Um, and this this I, I didn't really have the, uh, this option when I went through uh, with the with the thesis there. It is two semesters, so again that understand that that takes away one of your electives if you if you choose to do that. Okay, so as we talked, uh, as I just said, you know, in, in words a couple of um, slides ago, so this is what an example program would be like, you know, for your system engineering focus level area. Uh, so you do your two intro courses, and then you do your rest of your three uh, core classes. Your other classes again software is a required class uh, and then um, enterprise system engineering that's that advanced uh, class so once you get past the six classes uh, you should you should be uh, well positioned to be able to do this uh, advanced class uh, your two electives are system engineering and deployed systems so that kind of goes beyond uh, what we teach you know as you as you uh, go through t and e and you deploy it so now what do you do in terms of the sustainments and and operations and logistics and eventually um, uh, retirement of the system so so that's kind of beyond the uh, the system engineering life cycle in a v and then this is another example uh, uh, elective as metrics modeling and simulation for system engineering as you're kind of building some of the uh, uh, some of the models and doing some of the analysis of the metrics and then finally your master's project and your capstone project so again 10 10 classes uh five year sort of window uh if you do need to extend it for you know and, and life happens uh, we we all we all understand that so if you're you know deployed you know overseas uh, you know family emergencies you know things like that you can you can also um, request you know hey I, I need like another you know semester or so for uh, for an extension, and that's and that's fine um, uh, to be able to do that. What we don't want is the ten-year plan, uh, just because the material is always, you know, refreshed every every about like uh, about three to four years by our instructors. And you go too long, the 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 material gets stale, and um, and you, you're kind of learning old stuff there, or relying on old old materials. So there's a couple of different pathways to uh, to do your course. You can do it completely online if you're not in the uh, in the Washington D.C. area. You can do it completely live and on site if you are in, in the Washington D.C. area, or or you can do a mix of uh, both. So so just because you're in the D.C. area, you are not obligated to be on site. You can do a mix and match, and that's and that's fine. If you know you have a a pretty heavy uh, travel schedule one one uh, semester hey that's fine do the online 
and and that'll uh, and that'll be fine for them. So those are the three sort of areas where where you can take classes. Um, so here's where on site, if you are in the local area, um, in the DC area, here's where most of the classes are are taught. So the majority uh, of them are at the Applied Physics Laboratory. So as you can see, halfway between Baltimore and DC. Um, so for some of our government uh, partners and students um, in the DC area in Crystal City, uh, just on the south end of Crystal City, if you're familiar with that, we, we have a, a field office and so we hold classes uh, there. And then also, if you're more on the government side or the military side down at uh, the Southern Maryland uh, the Naval Air Station, Patuxent River, Pax River, um, there are some uh, some courses down there and we have a facility amongst other other uh, universities have a, a, a just outside the base, they have a higher education center and, uh, and Johns Hopkins has been a part of that for a while. So for if you're in the in the latter two, uh, DC or Pax River, um, you will take you can take some, but not all the classes uh, live there. Um, some of them you may have to drive up to uh, to the, the applied physics lab, or uh, if you want them live, or if you want to if you want to take them uh, online. You also see a, a VL there on the right, and that stands for virtual live. So this is a uh, something that we just started about a year ago, and it's actually met with some some good success. So the uh, so the online class uh, the, the online class is really a uh, and, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But the online the difference between the live and the online class the online class think of it as YouTube. So I've already recorded all the lectures. You can pull them at any time within the module. Usually it's like one one to two weeks is that module. So download all the lectures, listen to them as many times as you want, do the assignments collaborate with your teams, uh, and that's sort of the asynchronous uh, sort of uh, um, education. You, you do have a, a, a live office hour session once a, at least once a week with, uh, with your instructor to be able to ask any questions amongst any other, other times. So where the live has the fixed times, the online doesn't have any times, the virtual live is something that, that we've just started where You'll have the same schedule as a live uh, class, but if you're not in the DC area, but you still want the live interaction at the specific times, um, this is basically kind of WebEx's you or, uh, or, or VTC's you into the classroom. And so you're seeing the, uh, the, the classroom uh, live and you can participate, you know, you can hear the audio, participate via chat or voice uh, to there. And also the instructors will also um, you know, tend to try to treat you, um, you know, question-wise, just if you were also in the uh, in the classroom. Um, these sessions are recorded as well, like like an online course. And so, if uh, if that works for you, but you know, some some weeks you're off, um, you still have the recording. You still have the ability to uh, uh, to listen to the course. And this is for some students that um, it, it does take some discipline for an online course, um, just to say whenever you want to download it and read it and watch the videos um, some people need the, um, the the discipline of 4 30 every every monday i need to be in class and, and here's the uh, the dedicated time so this is something that we've we've started to do a little bit to uh to to, to do a little bit more outreach to the rest of the uh, the country there that can't be in the uh, the dc area and it, it's worked so far pretty uh, pretty well okay and so for uh, the focus areas, like you saw with the uh, with the live, um, the, the on site uh, online, uh, these are the same um, focus areas, uh, with the exception of um, uh, the biomedical, uh, the applied biomedical um, uh, engineering uh, focus area that that really requires a little bit more uh, time that's um, that's up at the Homewood uh, area there. But everything else uh, you can do online so yeah we, we are starting to have a lot of students that can do your uh, master's program completely online okay then I think this is the last slide or second to last slide so so faculty so who are we and and who are you being taught by so um, so for engineering we have a um, 
you know, over 90 instructors, uh, and again, a, a wide variety of backgrounds. Um, some were trained um, as systems engineers, and some, you know, come from different uh, different parts. Uh, you know, some are government, uh, some are from industry, as well as the majority are are at the uh, the applied physics laboratory there. Uh, and so it gives a, a diverse uh, set of um, uh, skills and backgrounds that we can uh, that we can talk to you about uh, because we have uh, the 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 site uh, you know right at the applied physics lab with all the courses. Uh, it, it's a it's a very easy thing to be able to take uh, instructors from the applied physics lab, literally walk across the street and start teaching. Just some examples uh, because this is a, a um, pretty much a systems engineering uh, focused organization. So you can see there's it's a wide variety of, uh, of activities that we work with the government. Um, so again, you can see healthcare uh, here on the left. Uh, we also have a space department that builds all the space uh, you know, equipment and satellites. The New Horizons just went to Pluto uh, and APL was a big part of that. Uh, and also with the government um, and our military uh, customers, um, you know, jamming techniques to counter uh, the improvised explosive devices, you know, things like that. You know, we're, we're really trying to uh, trying to save our troops there. So that's just a, a small sampling of what what the Applied Physics Lab does. And e each one of these, uh, you can see, it's a, a very uh, uh, needing a a good systems engineering foundation to be able to build these uh, successfully. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, you know, we've got some uh, uh, experienced instructors there. Um, and so uh, you can see with the teaching experience and the working experience, and then we try to apply those again in our in our teaching um, sort of sea stories, so to so to speak. Uh, you know, and here's where we see uh, good and bad requirements, good and bad tests, good and bad architectures, uh, as 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 uh, reinforcing our uh, our instruction. Okay, and finally, our last. Uh, our last, slide, our last slide for me. So this is our uh, the textbook that you'll see from the very beginning at the Introduction to Systems Engineering. This is the second uh, edition. So um, uh, Dr. Kazikov, um, before he passed away, so he was the director of the laboratory uh, in, in the the, uh, the center where you take classes um, is named after him. So he was uh, one of the giants in uh, systems engineering. And I would see going through my uh, doctoral program, I could see a lot of uh, uh, sources kind of referencing uh, what he had done. And so this is the second edition. Uh, and this is one of the first in, uh, system engineering books that was put into practice, really codified. Um, and this is actually an international uh, bestseller. Uh, and, and we know some of the uh, some of the instructors there um, that teach in our program here that have uh, have rewritten the, uh, the book. Okay, all right. So that's it. I'm going to turn it back to Cheryl. All right. Thank you again, Dave. Uh, now we'd like to share some information to help you take this next step. Some of the most common questions that our admissions team gets from prospective students is what is the tuition and what resources are available to help me pay? So here it is. Our tuition is currently $4,055 a course. Each of our courses are three credits. Uh, so this is the total tuition cost for each three credit course. Uh, because our tuition increases every year due to inflation, we encourage students to budget around $45,000 total for their degree. Uh, this you know, tuition cost does exclude books and materials, but however, in addition to, to tuition, you are not paying any fees. So there's no tech fees that you pay in addition to tuition. Uh, there's no student union fee that our online and part-time students have to pay. We do not charge students an application fee when they submit their application for admissions. Uh, so just uh, know that. The only fee uh, that we really charge our students on a regular basis is a fee at the end of their studies uh, kind of at the culmination of their degree, it's a it's a graduate fee, um, kind of marking the end of their studies. You have a variety of options available to you, uh, depending upon your personal circumstance. I really encourage you to investigate and to take advantage of any education benefits that your employer may offer. 
We unfortunately do not have any scholarships available for our online and part-time graduate students, but there are other associations and organizations that do. For example, the National Consortium for Graduate Degrees for Minorities in Engineering, otherwise known as the National GEM Consortium, offers fellowship programs. Uh, the rules, requirements, and application instructions can be found on GEM's website. Just know that if you are interested in applying for these fellowship programs, the application deadline is November the 13th, so just keep that date in mind. If you are a U.S. citizen or qualifying U.S. resident, you may be eligible to use financial aid. The financial aid that is available for graduate students is largely unsubsidized loans, so similar to that, you can, of course, Finance your education with a personal loan. Um, you know, really shop around, see what interest rates uh, are available to you. You know, do compare back. Uh, if you are considering to use uh, financial aid, you know, compare what, what rates are available and, and kind of make the best decision for yourself. Uh, and if you are active duty or retired military and you have veterans benefits, you can of course utilize these to finance your education. We do have a number of active duty and retired military enrolled in our online and part-time programs. If you are planning on using veterans benefits to finance your education, here are some things to keep in mind. The URL that you see on your screen right now, ep.jhu.edu backslash veterans, has some great information on what forms you need to complete and to submit in order to utilize veterans benefits at Johns Hopkins. Uh, our certifying official for uh, the Whiting School is Nancy Carr, uh, and she is incredibly helpful and responsive. You can find her contact information just by going to uh, this URL. For students who are using Chapter 33 post-9-11 benefits, the Department of Veterans Affairs sets an annual cap on tuition for private schools. That cap is $21,970.46, and that is for an entire academic year. So uh, fall, spring, summer, it renews every fall. Uh, we've just you know, talked about our tuition costs, so just doing some quick math for you, five courses will be just under the tuition cap. The cost for five courses is $20,275. The cost for six courses will exceed that tuition cap. That cost is $24,330. Uh, Johns Hopkins is a yellow ribbon school. How yellow ribbon works at Johns Hopkins it's that, is that it's applied only if the tuition cap is exceeded. And if it is exceeded, qualifying students can receive $1,000 per year. It's awarded on a first come, first serve basis. So uh, new, the Harry W. Colmery Veterans Education Assistance Act of 2017, otherwise known as the Forever GI Bill, was signed into law. This is very exciting. Uh, this law expands on the veterans education benefits offered through the Chapter 33 post 9-11 GI Bill. For example, it removes the benefit expiration dates for those uh, who were discharged or released from the military on or after J January 1st of 2013. So if this is you, you now have an unlimited amount of time to utilize your veterans education benefits. They do not expire. Uh, there's a lot of really exciting, uh, you know, expansions and benefits available in, in, in this uh, in this bill, this law as well. So for more information on the Forever GI Bill, I really encourage you to actually visit military.com and to search Forever GI Bill. They have some great information on what is available. If you are located outside of the U.S. and are interested in studying with us, here are some helpful tips to keep in mind. International students are, of course, welcome to study with us from their home country through our online programs, uh, regardless of whether or not you are studying with us um, online or on-site. If you were educated outside of the U.S., here are some additional admissions requirements for you. Uh, these students will need to submit uh, an international credit evaluation of any credit earned at uh, non-U.S. institutions. We prefer that students go through uh, WES, 
who is a third party that completes these evaluations, the specific evaluation you want to request is the ICAP. Uh, international students must also provide proof of English proficiency via, for example, qualifying scores on a TOEFL exam. For our on-site students, uh, in order to maintain their F1 visa status, international students must enroll full-time, which is three courses per semester, and only within those three courses uh, are you know, these particular students uh, able to take one course, online course per semester. Uh, and they also must provide proof of financial support to cover annual living and education expenses. So next steps and important dates. Uh, your first step, if you're interested in uh, beginning a program with us, is to, of course, to submit your application for admissions. You can do this by visiting the URL that you see on your screen, ep.jhu.edu backslash apply. Again, we do not charge an application fee. Uh, next, you'll need to submit your, your academic transcripts and your professional resume. We do have rolling admissions here. Uh, for our online and part-time students, it typically takes our admissions team about four to six weeks from the time that a student submits their, their complete application. So that's the application online plus their academic transcripts and professional resume. It'll take four to six weeks from us receiving all those documents uh, for admissions to review and then the department to review and then for admissions to issue that uh, applicant a decision letter. So with that that kind of timeline in mind, here are some important dates. Uh, the registration for spring actually opens on October the 26th, and our spring semester begins on January the 29th. So if you are interested in studying with us starting the spring 2018 semester, I encourage you to submit your application as soon as possible, ideally well before December 15th, um, so that we have enough time to review all of your documents. So that is the end of the prepared portion of this presentation. Uh, I've seen some of you have already submitted your, your questions, so I'd like to go ahead and, and open that up um, so that uh, Dave can start answering your questions. Uh, question number one, Dave, are you ready? Yes. All right. Question number one, could you possibly do two focus areas? Uh, no, so uh, the short answer is no. So yeah, it's it's just a, um, so if you're looking to kind of take a mix of courses for electives, I'd say look, just look at the system engineering focus area and that gives you the, be the best flexibility to take uh, whatever whatever you'd like. All right, great. Great, next question. Can the capstone project be work-related or should it be a separate effort? Good question. So so we always counsel that, so you can do whatever you want. Um, we always counsel to try to be not work-related and, and here's why. So uh, if you do a work-related project, so it has to be sort of original like yours, um, you also have to go through the whole life cycle of activities like requirements and trade studies and architecture specifications um, possibly if you start doing a work related project you already kind of know the solution you already know the direction your coworkers that are going to be your customers and stakeholders that you're going to interview are going to try to solve the problem for you and um, they'll, they'll get you way into the weeds not what you want at all and, and delay it a lot again if you if you tell them this is an academic effort and you know here's where you kind of uh, and you also have to not be classified not have proprietary information either um, so so with given all that constraints if you can still work it that's that's fine although um, you know some sometimes you may also be drawn to trying to trying to solve the problem that's that's not what the uh, what the project is um, uh, designed for. So again, we 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 discourage it, but won't uh, 
completely uh, reject it if you try to do that. And and we say, hey, you know, try something else, do a hobby or, or something fun, because you're going to be you're going to be looking at it for a while so over the uh, over the semester. All right, great. Uh, this question I can answer real quick. Can these slides be sent out? Yes. So we are recording tonight's presentation. And uh, I will email you a copy of the presentation within the next couple of days. So yes, um, this presentation will be available to you. Uh, next question, what is the length of the courses, uh, of, of each of the classes? So, so Dave, correct me if this is wrong, um, our spring and our, our fall semesters are 14 weeks, correct? Right. And then our yeah. summer, uh, semester is actually 12 weeks. It's just two weeks right. shorter. Yep. And so uh, for our online courses, uh, students actually complete like a module per week. Is that correct? Uh, it's it's either one or two weeks, and, and everyone everyone will do it differently. Um, mm -hmm. I I my my on my online class, uh, I have a couple of modules that's one week, and and a couple of modules uh, that that are a little heavier in material. Uh, they go two weeks. Okay, great, 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 great. And just so that you know, a module, I think that we, Dave mentioned this earlier in the presentation, uh, but uh, a module will contain basically everything for that particular lesson. So it'll, it'll include the recorded lectures, and those are recorded in basically like 15 or 30 minute chunks. Uh, correct, so that they're kind of easy to, to, to watch and navigate. And then it'll also include uh what dave it'll include readings it'll include yeah, discussions reading, and stuff like that yeah discussion uh discussion assignments uh quizzes uh, and then your then your homework assignments so yeah so so one of the requirements uh modules that i was talking about so yeah it's usually about three lectures you know each about 30 minutes or so um yeah a couple chapters in the textbook uh maybe a couple of reference uh, uh you know resources uh, reference you know documents that you might need and then your your assignment is, uh, you know, maybe like four questions, um, build a requirements document, uh, you know, answer some questions about your project, you know, and a couple other uh, couple other type of things. Uh, for the majority of system engineering courses, it's it's a little bit more kind of essay and architecture development, um, not not a lot of math problems. Um, that if that helps. Sure. Uh, this this uh, attendee just wanted some clarification. Uh, just uh, to repeat, Dave, the software and enterprise classes are required for all focus areas or just uh, systems? Uh, for, for the um, systems uh, focus area, the software engineering is required. It's one of the, the last sort of core class, so to speak. The enterprise uh, is one of four of the um, advanced courses. Okay. Uh, so you could take enterprise, uh, system of systems, management of complex systems, or system architecting. Okay. So, um, so, but that is just within the systems focus area. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so you you may have some in different focus areas. Uh, you, you, there will be different kind of requirements uh, in in terms of the. Uh, the flexibility for uh, for electives. So yeah, the, as an example, there's there's a couple of uh, like our cyber focus area. You may have uh, maybe like four or five classes, and you have to pick um, you know three out of five or so. So you have some. There's some that are required, and some that are elective. Okay. Okay. Uh, next question. Attendee wanted to know if. Uh, if we are offering any classes at the Homewood campus at this time, um, or if we have any plans to do so in the future? Not at this time, no. Okay. Okay. So not at this time. Next question. Uh, oh, this is a great question. This is a great question. Um, if you do a mix of classes via online and on-site, how many days of the week are you required to attend via the on-site classes? So how many days a week do our on-site classes meet? Uh, just one. Uh, so yeah, you, can, you can go to our, our website right now and, uh, and look actually at the courses. Uh, and so that's, um, 
It's generally Monday through Thursday. It's either a 4.30 to 7.10 slot or 7.20 to 10 p.m. But it's only one day, so that's about two and a half hours or so. Uh, yeah, and just once a week. Okay. All right, great. Uh, all right, next question. Oh, does Johns Hopkins have a career center to where uh, once we earn our degree, um, they would basically uh, help with finding uh, employment opportunities? Uh, yeah, with companies. So, so Dave, I'll, I'll answer part of that. Um, do you mind if we tag team this question? Yeah, no, no problem. Okay, so yes, we do have a career center um, that is available for our um, our full time students as well as our online and part time students. We are doing the career center is planning more, uh, you know, activities uh, that are more geared for our online and part time students just because they are um, you know, are working professionals. So they have slightly different needs from some of our full time students who are coming straight out of undergrad. Uh, so, you know, really exciting. There are webinars regarding, um, you know, resume development, even if you are, you know, at uh, your, you know, you have no plans to leave your, your current employer. We, um, I think they're planning on some, um, some programs for you just in terms of um, navigating your career path and things of that nature. The other thing that I'll mention is that we actually, uh, the Career Center is planning two separate uh, career fairs in the fall. So uh, I think they are both in, in September. So uh, it might not necessarily help you uh, immediately this go around, but um, they, they, they do. They plan career fairs um, and career fairs specific to engineering and STEM fields. So, uh, and those career fairs are open to our online and part-time students as well. Um, Dave, do you want to talk about kind of additional uh, professional guidance resources that are available? Uh, so I think I think you may have covered it. So yeah, uh, as as almost all of our uh, students are employed, uh, I think I think it's about ninety percent of our students, may, maybe it's higher, um, actually get like employer um, tuition assistance. Um, yeah, and so and so part of it is uh, just like you you'd be with the uh, other job if you're getting a transition. Yeah, there's some other professional organizations. Um, that that have some opportunities uh, for networking and, uh, and linking up. Um, in COSI, the International Council of System Engineering is uh, really the one and only uh, system engineering professional organization to be uh, to be involved with. And um, yeah, plenty of chapters all over the uh, uh, not only the country but around the world. And you get to uh, you know get to go to cool uh, cool different places every year. They have an annual symposium, that international symposium that bounces around from either the U.S. or other places. Uh, Cheryl and I were just in uh, Australia, Adelaide, Australia, uh, in July for the uh, for the uh, international symposium. Uh, the year before was Edinburgh, Scotland. Uh, next year is Washington D.C. And so yeah, it, it takes you all over the place. Uh, and so that's a really good uh, good chance to be able to um, um, you know network with a lot of different systems engineers. All right, all right, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, next question. Oh, okay. So th this attendee would just like a little bit of clarification regarding GPA requirements. Um, they read online that uh, need a, that uh, applicants need a cumulative of 3.0 GPA in their last two years of undergraduate study. Um, is that true? Can you talk about like where there might be flexibility regarding GPA or what what you look at when you yeah review so, applications? So yeah. Yeah, good question. So yeah, when when back back on the one slide when we talked about the three main items, it was the it was the undergraduate degree, the GPA, and the years of the professional experience. So yeah, we we do look at all three. 
that's that's something that I get when I get uh, the applicants. Um, it, it gives that that type of information where they work, how long, GPA, both you know at the latter half and uh, in the cumulative. Uh, and then there's links to looking at the resume, looking at the transcripts. So when I look at it, I look at everything. So it takes a little while to uh, to go through it. And yeah, and you can kind of see you know some some other uh, parts. Um, some people have have put in uh, letters of uh, letters of you know uh, statement or their, their personal statements um, some and some will ask for letters of recommendation some have have actually kind of put that in uh, as well and so that's that's that will all play into uh, into viewing it um, so yeah it's it's not just one part so if you if you're in that case you know where you may have a little lower GPA um, some of the other parts um, should kind of be uh, a little bit more buffed up um, uh, to be able to help kind of balance that out. All right. Okay, all right, so this, this question uh, is in, um, relates to uh, course load uh, per semester. Um, the attendee wanted to know if they could enroll in two uh, courses per semester, uh, it is a, a requirement for a local scholarship. Um, so Dave, I know that we typically tell students coming, starting out who are working professionals to just start with one course a semester, uh, but if, if they do have a requirement for a scholarship, would we prevent them from registering for two courses? Uh, no, no, not at all. So yeah, uh, we, we get all, all types. So yeah, so, so what Cheryl said was, applies to you know the majority if if you're just in no restrictions take one see how it goes uh you know unless you're really motivated and you know you know you're going to get done in a certain time or you're moving or something yeah I've taken two but yeah take one just to to see how it goes and then and then go for it so if there's a, a scholarship requirement yes that's that's not a problem to uh to do that um if if there's some issues in trying to register on the site, then you just you know email the registrar, email us uh, to be able to uh, to allow that to happen. That's that's not a problem. Some of the military um, students where they go full time, um, yeah, that actually may go to to possibly three courses. Uh, the Coast Guard is, um, I, I think they they make their students go it in like one year. So they they as you can imagine. Um, they, they are taking more than two classes a, a semester, and then we, we need to, to work with them. All right. Wonderful. 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 Um, I, I just want to be uh, you know cognizant of everybody's time. It's about 8.02 oh, uh, p.m. Eastern time. We have about uh, we have we still have some questions uh, left to answer uh, around seven. Dave, are you OK to continue answering questions? Dave? Hi, Dave, can you hear me? Oh, okay. All right. So it looks like um, Dave is just having some technical difficulty with his mic. Um, just give us a couple more moments, and uh, we'll be we'll be back online. Uh, I'll try and answer some of these questions that we have uh, remaining. And what I will do is uh, I will also email these questions to Dave. And if um, so, you know. Regardless, you'll have an answer both from myself and, and from Dave, uh, whether it's this evening or if it's shortly after the presentation. So the next question here is, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about um, number of courses per semester. Uh, there's a question about uh, how accessible are the professors 
Uh, for those taking classes online, our office hour study sessions usually, like, are any office hours typically hold or does it depend on the professor? So for all of our online courses, uh, we, we do actually have once a week live synchronous office hours uh, for students. And that is uh, something that the professor for the course will schedule with uh, their class. So that is, like I said, it's, you know, typically, you know, hour or so, it's, uh, it's live, it's synchronous, it is uh, recorded so that if you are unable to join, um, then uh, you can still review the, um, the that particular session. Uh, professors do not cover new material during these sessions. They are it's literally an opportunity uh, for for you, the students, to interact with your. Uh, professors in real time and to also um, if you're struggling with a particular concept and it gives the you a chance to kind of work it out in real time uh, with, with your professor there so it's a great opportunity um, our our faculty are all uh, working engineers so they are working just like you they have day jobs uh, but they are accessible in addition um, to those office hours they are accessible via email um, they typically respond to the students within 24 hours um, so yes yeah, so I would say that they are very accessible um, and, and you know they 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 understand they get it they because they are working engineers, they understand kind of the same uh, restrictions that you have on your time um, because they, they have similar restrictions. So uh, let's see, next question. All right, one moment. Uh, okay, so I think we've talked about this question before. Uh, is it if you know if you are working, is it doable to take one course per semester and still meet that five-year threshold? Absolutely. So if you if you take it's ten courses. So if you take uh, one course of, per semester and stay continuously enrolled, I mean you're looking at basically uh, three years uh, and a semester to complete your project your your program. So absolutely. Um, you can take one class per semester and uh, still complete the program within five years. Okay, good, good work, Sarah. I am, I am back. I don't know what happened. Oh, great! <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> okay, so um, here's a great question for the biomedical systems area. How often are you in class a week? Um, this is this is the same as. Um, the rest of our on-site courses, correct? It's just once a week. Right. Yeah, I think just once a week. Okay. Okay. And our classes are typically held like what? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, correct? We don't have any Thursday classes? Uh, mo Monday through Thursday. Monday through uh, Thursday. Okay. Uh, 430, 430 to 710 is the majority of those. Uh, there's some, if there's a lot of demand, uh, 720 to 10 p.m. But that's not... Not many. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, the, for for anyone who is uh, curious, there's there is a question. Who is our point of contact after the information session for for questions? Me. You you can absolutely email your questions if you uh, go at, after our information session and you you're kind of going about your evening and you think of a question, you can absolutely email it to me. I will send it to Dave uh, for him to respond to. Um, so yes, my email address, uh, you should have it <laughs> if you registered, uh, but just in case it's, it's Cheryl.Williams at jhu.edu and I, I'll be sending you a follow-up email uh, as well. So absolutely, you can email me any of your questions. With that, that in mind, uh, the, this evening, we we do have uh, information sessions uh, for our other academic programs planned throughout the, the remainder of the fall, and we will have another batch 
uh, of program information sessions uh, next year. And um, so I wanted to let you know that within an hour of the end of this presentation, I'll actually be sending you a follow-up email uh, with a survey. So if you could just take a couple of minutes and just fill out that survey for us, you know, let us know if this presentation uh, this evening answered all your questions and kind of met with your expectations. Give us any feedback that you might have. We really appreciate any feedback that you can give us. Uh, it really helps us to kind of think through uh, as we are crafting these events. Okay, so this question. Oh, oh okay. This, I'm, this is this is a pretty great question. So once you submit your application and are accepted, when do classes start for us? Um, again, classes for the spring start January the 29th. So if you uh, the fall semester has already started we are in full spring uh, you know we are the classes for the fall are already running um, so if you were to submit an application at this point it would be for the spring semester or you know for summer or fall of next year and so um, it would be the class start times for the those respective semesters and so the next start time is january the 29th um, how do you, you know, indicate whether or not you want to take online or on-site courses? You just simply do that by registering for the course that you would like. So you, you don't have to indicate on your application whether or not uh, you choose to be a quote-unquote online student or, you know, on-site or hybrid student or, or whatever. You just, um, when it comes time to register for classes, just register for the section uh, in the class mode that you would like. What is the typical, Dave, this is a great question for you. Are you ready? Yep. All right, what is the typical amount of hours we should spend on schoolwork outside of uh, the work school per credit? So yeah, how, mu how much um, hours per credit do we typically advise for yeah. students? Good question. Usually it's, it's like a, a three to one sort of rule of thumb. So if you have like a three credit class, then you should be, uh, you know, three any, or uh, any hours in the classroom, multiply that by three. So say it's like a two and a half hour course, uh, you know, instruction, you know, about six or so, you know, on the outside. So that may seem a lot, but, you know, as, as you talk about, here's a couple of chapters that you have to read in the textbook. There's some other reference, you know, papers to be able to read. Uh, here's the uh, the amount that you're doing with quizzes, um, teamwork, uh, working on assignments. So all of that, you know, totals about six hours, which you know you spread around, you know, a couple of days, and that's that's about right um, for uh, from from experience from taking courses here. Yeah, that's that's about right. So yeah, that's where you um, so you can do it like in a couple of couple of days if you're doing two classes then um, be prepared to have no life and you, know, you, <laughs> you get some other uh, you, know, you finish with one and then you got to start in with another so but if you have a if you have some motivation if you have a plan to, to finish early then you you do what you do all right all right wonderful but it's worth it <laughs> um yeah, it <laughs> All right, so this is uh, this will be kind of our final question for the evening. Thank you again, everyone, for for hanging in with us. Um, for a, a prospective student that works at APL, I regret to tell you this, but uh, any transcripts that you may have sent in as part of your kind of HR package um, at APL, you know, unfortunately here on the academic side, we don't have access to those documents. So you would have to send the documents to admissions. Um, as well and I, I think that's interesting that that's important to point out we do have a lot of students uh, who uh, come from APL so just in case other people have uh, that uh, question in mind as well um, yes you'll have to send us your transcripts yes yeah. Dave um, do you have any additional kind of parting thoughts this evening Words of wisdom for our, our attendees? Uh, no, I think I think we covered. We had a lot of good questions, and so yeah, you all you all um, answered a lot of or asked a lot of good questions. Uh, I like the ones about the work life uh, balance as well, because yeah, you, you have to 
make everything work. Um, leave time for your family and fun and any any other things um, that so squeeze that in at some point, uh, and, and you'll be and you'll be just fine, man. All right. All right. Well, Dave, thank you so very much for your time this evening. Thank you for answering all of our questions and giving us this great information on the program. All right. Glad, uh, glad, to, glad to be here and answer the questions and we'll hope to hope to see your uh, applications and hopefully see you in uh, class soon. All right. Wonderful. Wonderful. And thank you. Thank you all of you for attending this evening and for uh, staying up late with us. Uh, again, if you have any follow-up questions this presentation, please feel free to email me. Uh, my email address is, again, Cheryl.Williams at JHU.edu. And I look forward to uh, hearing from you soon. All right, with that, I'm going to go ahead and end our presentation. Thank you again for joining us, and we look forward to, like Dave said, reviewing your application. All right, take care.